How is it that you have become interested in, you know, how is it your background, life and trajectory and learning has brought you to this edge where you're making arguments for the investment in young children? Well, I've been interested in the question of labor economics and the economics of education and related aspects of success, economic success in the labor market my whole lifetime. I've been worrying about these questions for probably more than 30 years. And the inevitable consequence of looking at data on individual outcomes is that if you look at interventions at some stage in the life, you find that interventions like job training programs, which I evaluated for many years prior to, to coming into early childhood development, manpower training programs, adult remediation programs, adult literacy programs, GD programs, a whole litany of programs that have been devised to help people who suffer from disadvantage have had a miserable track record. Enriched versions, poor versions have not done very well. So anybody who looks at adult and, and late adolescent remediation is always left with the observation that these programs are not that effective, especially for the target population, which is disadvantaged people. So this led me to look back to how these disadvantages started when they start showing up in the lifetime of individuals. And as the data on individual development has proceeded, I've seen, and many people have seen, that these gaps in abilities that are very predictive of success in economic and social life open up at relatively early ages, as early as we measure them, three, four, five. And so you're drawn back. Anybody who's kind of honest with the data is going to find that the early years are playing a very important role for getting people ready for school, getting ready for the workplace, getting, getting attitudes and getting abilities that shape your whole life. So I think it, it's really a, more of an inventory of failure of remediation programs coupled with some very good evidence on early intervention programs towards severely disadvantaged populations being successful. That's the short answer. That's a great answer. Thank you. Let me just scoot in as far as you can. Okay. Um, you just covered a lot of uh, your general answer here. There was a, um, the role of the family. Right. It, it, there's a number of statements that you made, the major factor explaining the variation in academic performance of children, re referring to the Coleman Report. You yes. Could touch on the Coleman Report and go into your sense of how much of this variation is really reflecting of the, of the family rather than the culture, school. Well, I mean, I think Americans were really shocked. I, I, Coleman was my colleague here at the University of Chicago. He, he was in this room very often before he died. He's been dead now almost 10 years, maybe nine years, 1996, I think. Uh, but he and I taught classes together, many classes actually. And of course, I was very familiar with his uh, famous report. He wrote with many other people, but it was he was the research director and it's called the Coleman Report. The Coleman Report synthesized, uh, it really shocked people because it, 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 it challenged the opinion that schools were the major determinant of socioeconomic differences in the society, that schools are really responsi responsible for test score gaps and for achievement gaps generally. I think Americans have had the problem for the last hundred years of relying on schools, thinking that schooling was the great vehicle for equalization and the great vehicle for solving social problems. Uh, Coleman showed that the major determinant of the variation in test scores among children, black and white, all groups, many parts of the country, the major determinant was the variation in family inputs, not schooling inputs. Schooling quality per se, except in very extreme circumstances, had very little to do with the variation in outcomes in the, in the larger population. So people look to schools. George Bush right now is looking to schools. And what we learned from Coleman, and we've learned from a series of reports done ever since, that the family plays a much larger role in getting children ready for school, and that schools are not really effective vehicles for remedying disadvantage that are experienced by young children. So the structure of the, uh, uh, of the evidence, oops, yeah. yeah, I don't know what's going on. My wife's outside, but 
somebody's uh, just calling. It'll it'll ring out in about. There may be a voicemail, however. Okay. Uh, so the uh, the uh, the evidence uh, really points very strongly to the fact that schools um, are not the principal source of inequality, and. The recent evidence is pointing to the fact that schools are not going to be the vehicle for correcting initial disadvantages. Uh, I wish, however, the emphasis in public policy were quite different because, of course, the no child left behind discussions, the discussions about spending more money on schools, especially in these so-called accountability programs, is throwing away 30, 40 years of research that has been developed by since Coleman, really, and probably inspired in part by Coleman. Anybody who looks at schooling outcomes knows that when, if a kid shows up at age seven to public school and can barely speak, has no stimulation, that kid is gonna, not going to be corrected, brought back to a kind of hole by a public school eight hour, even six to eight hour a day program, even a very intensive public school program. So we know that. I mean, we know that as scientists, we know that as scholars, we know that as researchers who look at data. But unfortunately, politicians don't know it. And the, the, the last 10 years has brought out an, an incredible amount of emphasis on trying to revitalize the schools, allegedly great, great feats that have occurred through reducing classroom size by one half, uh, pupil, uh, you know, pupil teacher ratio by a half, and various kinds of small manipulations. It's as if we are like ostriches. We're sticking our head in the sand. We're not really looking at the really big question, which is out there, which is that the American family, especially disadvantaged families, that's what I'm talking about, is bringing children to the schools who are really severely damaged already by the time they're six and seven. And we can't rely on a public institution at six and seven to fix the family. And we do need the family under any event, even when the kid's in school, to reinforce what's going on in the school. So it's the family. It's the family. It's the family. But it, it has yet to make its way into public policy. Yeah, that's really interesting. The, the, even the universal preschool. I mean, the, let me back up. Relative to the conversation about public education, I'll tell yes. behind. We've interviewed Russ Whitehurst, who's the Assistant Secretary of Education and the Director of the Institute of Educational Sciences. He's responsible for the assessment systems and meets with the president and others to establish the basic policy that's driving all this. He, he and Reed Lyon are probably the two big mental drivers in the public policy, particularly related to reading and um, how to shift the educational system as a whole to increase performance. Well, I think, take Reed Lyon, for example. Yeah. He's written some very basic papers, very important papers showing that basic phonics methods, reading methods, you can improve learning. There's no question about it. But he's at NIH. He, more than anybody else, should know that there's this enormous uh, body of research suggesting that if a kid is not prepared by the parents coming into school, that a, a program that's designed for six, seven, eight-year-old kids is already starting pretty late in the process of getting the kid ready for success in school. So it, what, what strikes me is very odd. I think maybe it's a, partly a bias that has been built into the system. Uh, the idea that it maybe sells very well among Republicans, that somehow incentives are very important and monitoring public institutions is very important. What's happened is that basic lessons from core science, and we're talking about the science and, uh, and the biology and the psychology of early child development, are being ignored by this No Child Left Behind initiative. It's looking at cognitive tests. It's not looking at non-cognitive skills, socio-emotional development. It's focusing on people teaching to a particular test. It's kind of creating a kind of crass accountability system without recognizing that the child and that the thrust of a lot of the enriched early childhood interventions have not been necessarily on raising IQs. It doesn't. I mean, unless you get very early on in the life cycle of a kid, you're not going to really raise the kid's IQ. But you can raise that child's social competence, motivation, ability to succeed, and things that we call non-cognitive skills, things that aren't tested under the current scheme. So I'd be very interested in reading these interviews. In fact, I got to hold you to it so I can see what they said. But I would love to debate these people because I think these people are showing a very shallow understanding of how human skills are formed. 
And I think we really need a much more comprehensive understanding and recognition of that in public policy. I, I think such a dialogue is critical, and I'll do everything I can to facilitate it. But you will give me these uh, documents they have. Are there interviews? Or? Their interviews are all on our website. There's okay. 20 interviews on our website with, with uh, Reed Lyon, Russ Whitehurst, James Wendorf at the National Center for Learning Disabilities, um, Keith Stanovich, uh, 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 neuroscientists, a number of different neuroscientists studying different parts. I guess my point was, relative to Whitehurst, simply that they don't believe they can affect the family. So it's, it's, it's a case of it's outside, it's a Sufi key story, right? The light's over here. Right. The levers they have that can instrument any kind of change are over here in the public institutional mechanism. They don't believe it's possible to affect this. And until such time as universal pre-K becomes a uh, institutional system that they have any kind of control over, they're focusing their energies where they think they can make a difference, even if that difference is marginal by comparison. It seems pretty crazy to me that we're spending $550 billion over here where we're having a 20% maximum range of effect and we're spending a very little bit of money over here where, where the effect is 80% or something of the overall readiness for entry into school. Right. I think, I think that, that, that the aspect about the family gets to a very sensitive issue in American society. There's a question of what the boundary is of, of public policy. Many people, many, many people have raised this question. And the view seems to be that if we start tampering too much with a family, we're dealing with a very sacred and, and, and private institution, and it's not appropriate. I don't think anybody, certainly not me, and certainly not any of the individuals looking at early child development, are suggesting putting kids in orphanages. I mean, Jeremy Bentham, you know, at one time uh, suggested that as a means of social equalization. You could essentially uh, take kids out of their home environment and essentially put everybody, raise them in state orphanages to equalize that. Well, we tried that, actually. We actually tried that. Americans tried that. And other societies, Australians and New Zealanders, with their aboriginal populations and created completely uh, social ha havoc. We know that parents play a very important role. What's being suggested is not dramatic family intervention. It's more like family supplements. It's more like taking kids who don't have the advantages of middle class, upper middle class families, and giving them the same kind of resources that an educated mother, a, 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 a devoted father and mother family structure would provide them and disadvantaged kids don't have that. So you give them. Yes. Can you, I'm really sorry. Can you say that again? When you started that off, I got a microphone click. And that's so important what you just said. Okay. Well, no, what, what, what I'm saying is that we really want to be able to provide a, a, uh, an environment for disadvantaged kids that is comparable to what advantaged children have. And it's not a question of just giving the money. We tried that, too. We tried that in the Great Society. We tried that in the successors to the Great Society under Nixon. Cash transfers on welfare were not effective. And the reason is that the parents did not know, the disadvantaged parents, did not know enough about how to spend that money to improve the fate of their children. Uh, we need a directed, targeted transfer. Uh, uh, as a Chicago economist, I realize that sounds heretical, but actually it's documented that we, what we, where we have data, we know that early interventions have been extremely effective, uh, where we voluntarily provide these services, children enroll in these programs, parents of these children enroll their children in the services, the services supplement the family, they teach parenting skills, so they follow up the kids, and they provide a framework whereby the family and the uh, child are both stimulated. And with long-term follow-ups, 30, 40 years now in the case of Perry, 40 years actually in the case of Perry Preschool, 21, 22 in the case of the Abbasidarian program, and going, by the way, in both cases, long-term follow-up uh, in studies done here at Chicago, Chicago Parent-Child Program, all suggest that these interventions in the Olds program and Elmira, you can go down a fairly long list uh, the studies done by Darlington and Lazar and, and so forth and so on are all suggesting with long-term follow-up that people benefit. And the way it benefits these children primarily is through motivation, through social attachment, which feeds into achievement. But it's not a straight academic learning program, which is where the Reed Lyons and the Whitehurst and the other people have missed the boat. 
and I think are misleading Bush and, and misleading the entire uh, I think that's great. Discussion. And here's the counter to that somewhat, just to exercise it out, which is that they've, they've watched children that have gone through um, Head Start and programs that focused on social emotional development as, it's, as their core. Yes. And when these kids hit the wall with reading, the psychological consequences of not getting through reading devastates the emotional positives of these early nurturing environments. That's why the focus on reading, that's why the focus on whatever it takes to get them through, even though I agree with you <laughs> that, that, that the particular systematic mechanics that they've evolved and trying to make some kind of a protocol out of that is way off the mark right now. Their, their research is saying, look, we can do whatever we want to make these kids feel better, have better attitudes, but when they get to this reading challenge, if they don't get through it, if we don't get them through that, it doesn't matter. The psychological damage is horrific. And my sense is from talking to people that are casualties of this process, from teachers, from people that just watch the psychological, emotional development side, that that, that is very strongly corroborated. That kids that don't make it through reading, the, the psychological consequences of developing a distrust in your ability to process because of the difficulties of reading, uh, devastate their, their uh, emotional trust in their own minds. Yes, but you've got to be careful. What's a precondition for reading? You see, and I'm not denying anything you just said, and I think it's valid. But if you start thinking about it, I mean, you know, let's go out of the uh, human race for a minute and go into chimpanzees or rhesus monkeys. I was last week, I was at the Society for Research and Child Development. I'm writing a paper with Judy Cameron, who's a primatologist at the Oregon uh, Primatology Center. She's also a psychologist at the University of Pittsburgh. So what does she find? She can do experiments in a way that we never can in human beings. She can take children, or I shouldn't, I'm using the word children, these are rhesus monkeys, young rhesus monkeys, taking them out away from their parents, or their mother really, they have a herd, but the mother still is in that herd looking after the young monkey. And if you take and you sever that emotional bond and you create a child who's substantially fearful and, and withdrawn, and that's what happens when you take away the mother and replace it, say, with either no mother or some harsh mother or something of the sort, then the child becomes much less willing to explore, much less willing to venture out. So now everything you've said is true. But the point is, if you start too late in these socio-emotional interventions and you don't, rec and, and she finds, by the way, she can actually ask, when can you remediate? Take the mother away at one week. These are chimpanzee, uh, rhesus monkeys. They have a lifespan of 30 years. Basically, they're adults by age five. They grow up very quickly. But nonetheless, in the first six months, they can experiment with one month replacement of mother, one week, uh, six weeks, uh, six, six months. And what, what you find is that the first few weeks are very critical. And unless you can supplement the resources of the mother, uh, you basically find a kid who grows up socially maladapted. Now, what does that mean in part? The, the, that, 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 that young, uh, young monkey is less willing to explore. Exploration is how we learn. We learn to read, we learn to write. And they're much less willing to interact socially. Social learning is a very important phenomenon where we learn from each other. So I would ask, are these studies so definitive that they look at the preconditions that gave rise you know, they may have had a bad intervention. I'm not saying that, that reading and supplementation is a bad idea, but I find the evidence that it simply early remediation is not effective. Socio-emotional remediation just simply flies in the face of the Abyssidarian evidence, the Perry evidence, and the other evidence where you have relatively early interventions that seem to stimulate people into doing reading, writing, and a number of other so academic and social competences the rest of their lives. So I think the case is far from clear. And, and, the, and the danger in the current strategy is that people are focusing exclusively on one narrow aspect of the learning process, not looking at preconditions. So uh, the trouble with this whole business about social or emotional development is it has a warm, fuzzy quality. Somebody was uh, talking to me a few weeks ago, and they said, this is Oprah material. You know, you're talking about motherhood, you're talking about all these soft... But it's important, and the, and the Cameron work is very, very definitive in this. I mean, she can do studies in ways that we never do. And there are comparable studies, by the way, with rats. You know, we don't think of rats as so cuddly as monkeys. But rats actually also, if you deprive the rats, I mean, they, there they have a very interesting structure. It turns out a, a very warm, nurturing mother uh, rat is a rat who is called, called overarching. 
So you will hump her back and sort of make her nipples available. And it turns out that an overarching mother rat, who essentially is, is, is nurturing in this way, produces young rats who can run through the maze a lot faster and more effective than the rats who are not born to non-overarching mothers or have no mothers at all or surrogate mothers who are harsh, not overarching. So I'm not suggesting this is all hard science. I mean, a lot of it is got gaps in it. And certainly when it comes to human beings, it's not like we have laboratory experience. We can't do them essentially uh, on these kinds of questions anyway. But what we do know is that all of the enriched follow-up studies, which have been effective, which have huge cost-benefit ratios, have shown the formation of what I would call non-cognitive skills. And that has been the single, you didn't raise IQ at the Perry Preschool. You did raise educational attainment, you reduced crime, you reduced teenage pregnancy, you reduced the amount of wastage of time people taking remedial education in school, and on and on and on. That, I would say, is school readiness. And I think to deny that school readiness is an important ingredient. To no one saying you should shut down reading programs. What I think one should say is, it's so narrow. And it's putting such a burden at such a late stage in the process that it's, that it's redirecting too many resources towards a small, and I think not the most significant component of the, of the child's life cycle. Good. Um, we are... Uh... We think that the reading process is, we see the reading, the reading thing as this great barrier, this great artificial wall that a child, when they're born, has this uh, destined challenge, like the obstacle course wall, to get over that. If they don't get over that, it, it, it's um, uh, significantly uh, negatively influencing the shape of their lives thereafter. But the question is, when does a child learn to read? The, when the child starts learning to read, when they're in the crib. Exactly. Uh, like Patricia Kuhl has brought out, right? That mother ease, the degree that mothers are, are punctuating vowels, right? In right. their mother easing is changing the degree to which children are differentiating sound, Absolutely. which directly correlates to how well they're going to talk, which directly correlates to how well they're going to read. Exactly. No. So, every... so I'm not saying reading per se, like, let's, like reading as the utility skill is the big deal. I'm saying it's the big obstacle wall that everything else is, is leading up to and that has a major effect on their lives. And that that particular wall is a technological artifact. It's not like any of nature thing that we study. Well, be careful, though. I mean, again, it's, it's social. I don't know. I wouldn't call it technological. I would say that we're talking about uh, richer versus poorer environments. So if you grow up in a very fluent environment where people are correcting the punctuation, where they're giving you a wealth of vocabulary, where they're explaining to you patiently, oh, Johnny or oh, Susie, this is the way this word is pronounced. This is what this word means. There are multiple meanings to this word. You misused it. The kid learns that at two, three, four. I mean, when the kid starts speaking, it's, it's subconscious. So these programs are talking about doing this much later than two, three, four. Sure. And the point is, is that if you want a good reading program, you're not going to ask the schools to do it, not the schools as they're currently constituted. They're going to ask uh, rich, in, enriched families or enriched daycare centers or whatever you want to call them to essentially provide those options, which are provided already. And at by some the, point, support parents in becoming more aware of the need for this, the yes. need for how they participate in their child in terms of uh, how critical that is to the child's life success. Correct. No, I think that's very important. And I think that's been one of the benefits of these intervention programs that have talked to the parents of disadvantaged kids. And said, "Look, uh, uh, look, you uh, uh, you play a more important role than you may know. You play a more important role than your mother may have played in your life, and you can you can fix what happened. You know, you may have suffered certain damage, you may have a so you know have certain disadvantages yourself, but there's no reason for your child to suffer from those. And and send the kid. So, for example, here in Chicago, we have a program funded by the late Irving Harris. It's at the Robert Taylor Homes, which are some of the worst neighborhoods in Chicago." Those programs are essentially oversubscribed. You could have thousands of kids in those programs. They're spending $16,000 a year on those kids, they, they being the Harris group, and they're essentially enriching the lives of those kids. And there's no shortage of parents who want to do that. So that's why we know that parents probably care. They will learn and they will send their kids. It's not a question of intruding in the life of the kid. It's a question of supplementing it. The mother still has the kid 16 
18 hours a day. It's not as if the kid is being taken away. And we know that the mother plays a very important role. Even a poorly educated mother who cares is playing a huge role in nurturing, supporting the kid. But we can also improve the parents in the sense to teach them what, why their role is so important in a way that since they have no example of this, they may not have no example of this, it supplements their own understanding of how to actually raise their kids. Right, and it seems to me that the more that we're able to help them, the more that they're not only helping their children, but it's doing something that's helping them change the broader context of the family's uh, socioeconomics in a way that's also helping the child and helping the family as a whole. Correct. That's yeah. correct. That's, that's so there's, exactly a, right. there's a benefit from things that don't just pull the child out of the home, but that engage the family as a whole. Well, there's some evidence that the mothers in particular of the children who receive the interventions uh, and who take part in these so-called home visitations and center visitations where the mother goes in, that they themselves are improved in some ways. They see new opportunities for themselves, maybe new motivation, maybe get some new meaning. The evidence there is not rock solid, but it's certainly suggestive that there are interventions, these interventions are also helping the parents. But any logical program, any program that thought about how families would work would suggest, yes, you raise the kid, but if you have a hostile environment in which you send the kid back to, it's not going to be that effective. The parents could simply uh, say, look, uh, I don't believe in this, or I think this is a waste of time. If your children are now uh, getting the stimulation at home, and, and this is just common sense, we, we, we can see that any measure of parental involvement in schooling typically improves the quality of the uh, outcome of the child in terms of going to college, getting test scores, no participation in crime, and on and on and on. So you're right. I mean, it's a family supplementation. You know, it's funny. I mean, in the, in the current environment where Bush was running on family values and family, it seems to me that the Bush strategy is uh, actually a little bit inconsistent on this point. I mean, I would have thought the conservatives, in particular the religious conservatives, would have jumped, done handsprings, to think about some ways to improve the quality of family life, to teach values. That's what we're talking about. A lot of these are values issues. It may not be a religious issue and sort of believing in one religion or another, but what it is is teaching respect, self-control, temperance. It's teaching things that are, I think, pretty essential features of success in social life. Emotional and self-regulation at the exactly, core of all of it. Exactly, and that, I think, is what's another name, polite name, at least when you apply it to young kid, for family values. I mean, it's the same idea. So I would have thought that the Bush group would have been very supportive of this. But somewhere down the line, it seems that uh, in Texas in the mid-90s, there were these reforms. There, there definitely were some improvements in the reading scores of kids. And then it became routinized into the idea of an exam, an accountability system. It sounds very, very good. But the trouble is it's very limited and it's un, it's un it's unrealistic. I mean, I think, and that's when you go back to the Coleman report. You know, the Coleman report said we really had to look at the family. I mean, the family was the major source of inequality, not the school's inputs. It wasn't more pupil, uh, a higher pupil teacher ratio or a lower pupil teacher ratio or higher salaries. Those were second order. What was really important were the family environments. And, 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 and that still is being missed in a lot of it. And I don't think it's beyond what we can do. It's, and again, it's not coercive. We're talking about supplements. We're not talking. Where it might be coercive is you have a parent who means ill for the child, a parent who really abuses the child, who wants the child to stay out of modern society. There are cases of the Amish, for example, in, in, in Pennsylvania. They're not abusive, but they're very much opposed to letting the child get exposed to secular knowledge. And that does put a lot of the Amish kids at a disadvantage. It's a real issue there about values. But I don't think that's the issue. We can avoid. Let the Amish raise their kids how they want. Let various other sects raise it. The majority of children uh, have parents who want them to do better. And if they're given a means of doing so, we'll jump on it and do handsprings to do it. So I don't think it's a question of intrusion. I think it's a question of supplementation. I also think, by the way, that a way that a lot of the advocates of early childhood have proceeded is they've made it sound like it has to be a government program. It has to be run by some, and that creates already a whole opposition, which is, it's a totally separate issue. You can have private centers. You can have religious centers doing this. It's not a question of, of whether or not it, it's, it's a government center or a private center. What you want 
is to provide the resources to allow the kids to have their lives supplemented, whether it's provided by a public or private vendor, is an important question, but it's not the central question. And, and I think, again, you know, there's an awful lot of zealotry going on in the early childhood movement and, you know, the various foundations that are saying we shouldn't have any interventions before age four. And that's crazy. Especially when we look at the, the slope of development. The slope of development. Four, four, four years old is already late in the game. Exactly. And if you look at the Abbasidarian data, where they started at age four months, you realize that Abbasidarian raised IQ. It's the only documented long-term intervention where we've seen a boost of four to five points on IQ. That's a quarter standard deviation of the IQ. It's a quarter of the block wide IQ gap. And that is a lasting effect. That starts at age six when it's first measured. I mean, the, the intervention starts at four months. The first measurement's about age six, and it lasts till age 21, which is the latest measurement. So I don't know if it's, I, I would doubt sincerely it's going to fade away in the next 20 years. Or So I think that the structure of uh, the Science is there. The knowledge is there. The base is there. But what, what's happened is, is that various well-meaning groups on both the left and the right have kind of made political issues out of things and not focused on what the essentials are. You know, there's another whole group that's tying together the issue of child development with universal uh, daycare, provision of daycare for working women. And those are two logically separate issues. I mean, one may or may not want to provide that. But to tie those issues also is going to create an automatic opposition. These are not the same issue. The issue is providing resources to young children in a voluntary, non-coercive way. And it could be through, as I say, public, private. It doesn't have to be tied to anything else. But I agree completely that you want people to be able to intervene much earlier than age four. I mean, it's, I think it's insane to stop at age four. But I, but I recently became aware that certain groups were violently opposed to interventions before age four. Why? Because they had tied this to some political initiative of universal uh, child care. And, well, that's fine, but those are tactics, and I think those are probably dangerous tactics without a scientific basis. You read the RAND report from, that was done for uh, the Packard Foundation in California that came out a week ago? I skimmed ago. it. Uh, yeah. Summarize it for me. They're making some well, statements along these lines. Right? Basically along these lines. They're coming institutional convenience, saying, look, we, the bang for the buck is better uh, with just one year than two. And we're talking about being ready for school, so therefore four-year-olds, because that way we're getting them into a system that's going to have some <laughs> continuity. But it's, the logic is all... Uh, around what's institutionally convenient, right. what's convenient to institutionalize, perhaps is a better way to say it, rather than wh where do we kit these kids in the critical developmental slope where we have the most amount of leverage to lift their lives. Right. And I think that's a very, very large... I, I'll be honest, I've been participating in various discussions with people on these topics for the last few years, and I have been very disappointed by what I've seen from these advocacy groups, because... I mean, it, I, I did skim that report. didn't read it closely, but an associate of mine whom I trust read it closely and said he thought it was without foundation. That it was, you know, basically this narrow, technocratic report without any real understanding of the neuroscience and the development process of young kids. And somehow, it's just, it's too easy. The trouble is these foundations get in the act. They have agendas. There's some foundation head or some donor or somebody who has a particular axe to grind. And so the the axe is ground. And I, that's fine. That's their money. They can spend it as they wish. But what bothers me is that in this area, because there isn't so much consensus, you're getting a lot of this kind of crossfire where people are sort of undercutting each other, advocating extreme positions without evidence, and not providing a kind of reasoned dialogue and, and listening to alternatives. So, you know, the idea, I, you mentioned universal pre-K. <laughs> I don't agree that it should be universal. And the reason is, is that I think advantaged families have a lot of resources. I would say if it's a facility, uh, you would not want to exclude advantaged kids from going to that facility, but they'd better pay. There's no reason to subsidize them. Their parents have the resources. There's no reason to spend taxpayer dollars on this. You know, we're not trying to create a new commune system here or some kind of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, of a kibbutz where we're trying to sort of form the new American through some kind of common identity, what we're really recognizing in all the studies, really, every single long-term study has been on disadvantaged, 
predominantly, in fact, almost exclusively minority children. And if you ask, where is the firmest evidence? It's where we've studied it. Now, I have no doubt that they're Appalachian children. They're children from very disadvantaged white environments, Indian environments, and, and maybe some Hispanic children uh, also who would also benefit from this. I have no doubt there's disadvantages. It's not uniquely black phenomenon, no means at all. But I'm saying where we have the hard evidence is on the disadvantaged populations. And it's not on the children of uh, Will Matt, Winnetka, or Shaker Heights. I mean, they may have disadvantages, but those disadvantages may be we're just back not getting spanked. We're back to institutionally somewhere. convenient mechanisms. How right. can we do this? And what, what seems to be the subtext is, let's pull kindergarten down a year. Right. Right? Right. And make that, and that's what, that's what universal pre-K is kind of a, you know, a, 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 an obscuring metaphor for. Yes. As distinct from how is it that we spend our resources wisely to lift that part of the population that's having the greatest degree of struggle um, have a, a, a more uh, equal opportunity to start into this world. Right. Now, the, there is, uh, if you go to and listen to the Washington poli quote, policy makers, the policy wonks, I mean, there's a special language they speak, a special, uh, uh, oh, what should I say, uh, uh, a special uh, uh, a set, a set of terms, jargon-laden terms, uh, and they're, they're, they're always interested in these issues of infrastructure, targeting, and making sure you get the right spin. Uh, but look, I mean, we have gone far enough in this area to know that what we really have is some knowledge now of, of, of the development process of the child. And we certainly have knowledge of the development process of other species. We know that early years, the earlier years are critical. We know there are such things as critical periods. You take an eye, you sort of hold the eye, uh, and put a patch over the eye of a young child over a certain range, and that child's going to grow blind. It's not going to have the visual stimulation. So you can, we can create a blind child by not giving that child stimulation at an early enough age. We also know that language and language acquisition is something which has a very important basis. I mean, there are different aspects. Language is a very complicated process. You can learn words, vocabulary, until you're late in life. But if you look at the track record on adult literacy programs, trying to remediate, you know, just basic structure, syntax of language, if you haven't learned that at an early enough age, it becomes extremely difficult. You've read these findings, for example, even of something about learning a language. So there, there are these studies that were just recently executed. One of them was published in Science Magazine. Very interesting study. What did it show? Well, it showed that children of parents who signed, if they learned the sign language when, before they were age 11, the critical period, were able to do the signing as well as they could do the speaking. They could interact with their parents with signing, and they did it in, a, in an effortless way. Past that age, past the critical or sensitive period, those children had to distribute this in a much more inefficient way in learning sign language. We know this about foreign languages. We know this a lot about aspects of the language acquisition process. So it's not just a question, it's not the sense that in some stages we know if we don't intervene early enough, the stimulus isn't provided, the remediation is maybe infinitely costly, it may be impossible. We also know that if we wait, it's costly. It's not as efficient as doing it in a younger, early age. So the, what should drive the policy here should be the science of the early childhood formation and the science of brain formation, which is starting to get mature. It's, you know, it's, not a, it's not like we can press a button and talk about a trajectory and predict. But you know, all of these preconceptions that drive American public policy are based on ideas that are 40, 50, 60 years out of date. I mean, John Dewey was a, was a great guy, but, you know, the idea of the common school was probably also extremely great at a time when you had intrinsically very healthy families who would tell Johnny and Susie and, and, and who else to go off and look at the structure of, you know, do your homework and, and, and live on your time. So I think it's time to sort of build on this knowledge, which is there. It's real. It's not like we're making it up. It's excellent. Hang on, I'm going to adjust the mic okay. just a little bit. Oh, you have a problem with it? Yeah, it's good. there's a little. Sometimes it, it just slips after a while. It's okay. a great conversation. Thank you so much. Okay, well, it's interesting to me. I, I've got to get your website again, though. I think I mislaid it. Maybe, do you have a card that has the website yeah, on it? Good. Go. That's good. 
Uh, but so, uh, yes, we talked to uh, Jack uh, Shankoff when we were. Um, well, I was just with him last week, actually, yeah. in Atlanta. When and, did you uh, speak with him, actually? There's no one of the things about the sensitive period uh, that's different about the, than the critical period, which you're alluding to in all of this. But that's really not that clear about fundamental primary language. We can see that about secondary languages, like you said about sign language. But <clears throat> with the primary language, what is the sensitive window and what is the cost of trying to compensate for not having kind of surfed the slope the right way in the beginning? And the, the neurological studies of children that are developing well suggest that there's this big explosion in vocabulary, in the rate of vocabulary development that's happening around three years old. Correct. Somewhere between two and three and a half years old. Correct. And it's our sense that if that gets delayed too long, these children are way out of time sync with what preschool and school Correct. Are, are assuming the interface to be. No, correct. No, so, so again, it's a question then, I mean, there are, there, you see, this issue has been raised about, well, you know, do you want to intervene too early? We talked about that. And there's a whole set of issues about intervening in the family. And people are very sensitive, and justly so. It's the wrong word. Yes, it's not intervening. It's not like changing. It's giving opportunity. So, for example, you know, a, a subject we all know. People don't like to talk about it, but it's uh, part of the... It's hard to be in an American society, and I recognize it. Doug Massey, my former colleague here now at the University of Pennsylvania wrote a book about it. We know there's something called ghetto English. We know that kids grow up and they speak a certain kind of jargon. They speak a certain language. They have their own, uh, you know, people claim the hip hop vocabulary is actually quite creative. It really can capture a lot of phenomena that are not what it, what it may be traditional phenomena, but certainly the phenomena that uh, people speaking it would say. But nonetheless, what experience, I mean, but nonetheless, it is the case that a child growing up with a kind of special language that isn't mainstream, that doesn't have the access to sort of the vocabulary, the syntax, sentence structure of modern, uh, just the standard English, you know, which, which anybody, a, an immigrant coming in trying to assimilate, would try to learn, starts out with a disadvantage. And it's, it's no different in terms of a language acquisition skill than learning a foreign language. And so the point is, again, I don't want to get into the issue of three versus four, but I do know there's a lot of studies showing rapid development of language skills. But a lot of that is social, too. A lot of that comes from peers. A lot of it comes from social learning, from picking up on other people. We don't have a, we don't have a lot of data, but we do know that's one of the... We do suspect, I should say, be careful. Uh, but we do suspect that one of the major determinants of uh, creation, of... Uh, of, of language is really having a rich, nurturing environment. After all, the parents in those early years are the principal source of verbal and intellectual stimulation during that period of time. And if they provide that stimulation, uh, the kid will benefit from it. If it's not provided, it's not as if it's impossible to remedy, but it's difficult. And it gets more difficult the longer you wait. And we're talking is six that and the, seven. the obstacle course doesn't wait for them. No, the object, nobody's waiting for anybody in this right? sense. So, so they're, they're out of sync with the takeoff aperture of getting through that wall later. Well, right. But you see, I think it's a little artificial. The wall is our social construct. It is. And I, I don't think it's a... So it's true that when you're seven years old, we had a CEO, that was his self-title uh, here at the uh, Chicago uh, Board of Education. Uh, I've forgotten his name. He ran for governor a few years ago. Pretty smart guy. I remember listening to him once. And he made some very useful observations. He wasn't making excuses. Chicago public schools are awful. But he said, look, how can we take a kid who's seven, eight years old, six even, can't read, can't write, has no rudiment, parents really haven't stemmed, we can't make up for that. And all he was saying on a pragmatic level, having tried to do this for a period of time, was that you really do suspect, and actually we do know, that the early interventions, the I hate to use the word intervention. The early stimulation, the early environments playing a huge role in shaping later advantage. We know that. We know that. It, it's not a question of, 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 uh, of uh, any uh, uncertainty. And so much of American public policy is still based on the idea that we can wait till age 10. We can wait to age 20. We can sign them to a job training program. 
we can send them to a GD program. We can fix it if it's broken early along. And, and that's why I go back to the remark I made at the beginning of this interview, that I studied those programs extensively about 10 years ago. And I found that to a, to a program, you know, with some minor successes here and there, these programs are nowhere near taking people who started in poverty out of poverty. Very few ever escape it if you start at age 19 or 20. The early programs, the studies where we have the long-term interventions, have shown huge gains. And people are moved out of policy, and they are uh, out of poverty, sorry. And they are moved into the middle class, and they are removed out of the jail, and they are moved into graduating college, and they are less likely to go into remedial education, and on and on and on. So there's a very high productivity argument that uh, I think can be made, and it is made. I've made it. You saw the paper I wrote. Uh, there are a lot of other people making similar arguments. It's a pretty well-documented argument. You know, does it lead to a policy of the kind of Senate bill, you know, HR or, or House bill HR 9388? No. But, and in fact, it's dangerous. But I think what we could do is provide funds to supplement based on the programs, the prototypes that already exist. We know that those programs work. There's a real gap yet as to how to implement those more broadly. But I think that's a gap that should be filled. You know, you look at these successful programs and you say, well, they're too costly. You're spending too much money. Well, if you look at what we spend per child in normal public education and school districts, the cost of these programs is very comparable. Very not sixteen thousand a year. That's a very high end, the, the Harris program. But eight or nine thousand a year in current dollars is about what the uh, uh, ABC Darien program and the Perry programs are spending, and those will documented to have long term intervention, long term effects. Yeah, and I would imagine that, that you can correlate that with the efficiency of all the dollars spent subsequently in public education on that child. Oh yes, no. Actually, <laughs> if you just look at savings on the uh, remedial education, trying to bring the kid up to standard. The kids in these treatment groups who actually get these enriched early interventions are much less likely to be needing special education, remedial education. Now, even more dramatic is uh, the really dramatic reductions in crime. If you look at criminal activity, a colleague of mine uh, once computed that uh, if you looked at the savings, just the reduced crime rates, of a targeted population, and crime is primarily a male phenomenon. Suppose you just took men, targeted the population to disadvantaged men, these are primarily minority males, black males, that you would actually, just in terms of the expected benefit in crime reduction, more than pay in terms of reduced jail costs. I mean, you're talking about 35 to 40,000 a year for housing one prisoner, 40,000 a year. And you get a reduction in crime rate by 60, 70%. You're getting returns that are enormous just on crime. But you forget about crime. Think of teenage pregnancy, drug use, even smoking. Things, activities that many people say, well, it's not healthy. You find uh, in a number of dimensions of activity, there are gains that occur uh, to the children. And they pay off financially. People have made calculations. Now, some of these calculations are a little bit exuberant. You know, they get carried away. They look at all these benefits. But even, and, and it is a serious question that an economist has to address. The, the question is that these benefits take place, uh, the costs take place right now, and the benefits take place in about 20 years when the kid starts walking on, uh, and, 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 uh, when the kid is starting to walk on its own two feet. And what that means is you get a, uh, a real gap. You have a 20-year investment period, and that's a tough sell. So people get confused by, well, they look at these figures as an eight to one in gain. That's true. Eight dollar return for each dollar invested. But it's realized 20 years later, which in terms of a rate of return lowers it considerably. You have to go through the net present value equations. and You go through the net present value and you recognize the fact that these guys are not going to show up in society until age 20. Now, if you're really careful, you do the accounting throughout the whole school year. You look at the effect through the structure of remedial education, you look at crime, you look at all the intermediate steps, all those are showing the kids a more efficient student, a less likely to be arrested, less likely to need to be tracked, socialized. And so you save a lot of institutional infrastructure, but the earnings gains don't show up. The schooling doesn't. In fact, you don't want it to show up until you want them to go to college or at least junior college, get a degree, adjust to the new economy and, and succeed. And, and they do. I mean, they do at a differentially greater rate. 
Uh, so that's why it's strange. But, I, but, you know, every one of these good ideas has surrounding it barnacles of advocacy groups and people who are extremely, uh, extremely negative uh, and, and, and political, political in a way that I think is unconstructive. To me, it would be very nice if people would go back to the main points here and say, yes, Reed Lyons right, Whitehurst is right, but they kind of miss the point. How do people get to be school ready? How do people get to be reading ready? You don't get to be reading ready by just showing up at age six or seven. You don't, you know, there is a wall maybe, and it's certainly true that people fall behind, they get discouraged. This is uh, consistent in some ways with the notion that, you know, if you have a negative perception of yourself after a while, it would be hard not to. If everybody around you is reading and you're not, you might start to wonder how good you are and what you are. No question about it, but there's no question that it's likely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I've studied that, but I think it's plausible. But on the other hand, you ask, well, wouldn't it help a lot if you have, I mean, here in Hyde Park, Chicago, Kenwood, where I live, uh, a lot of parents are spending an enormous amount of time reading to their kids. They read stories to their kids. They teach words. They make sure that most kids, by the time they're walking in to their kindergarten, actually have rudimentary reading and writing skills. They're not like going in cold and saying, here, I've never seen this letter A before. That's amazing. What is it? They know the letters. They know the numbers. Maybe they're pushed too hard, but you don't have that pushing going on at the lower strata. And I, and I say that without being condescending. I'm saying disadvantaged families are not doing that to their kids, and we know it. We have measures of how much time the mother reads to the kid. When we look at what happens 20 years later, the mother's read to the kid. Even we hold the mother's ability constant, even we hold family income constant, we do find a greater achievement of that kid. And so that's common sense, but it's that, that connects to Farkas. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, that's underneath SES that both uh, Hart Risley has done and Farkas has done and others have done is to show that this language bath, the speed, the complexity, the range of vocabulary, whether it's read to or spoken to, how well the children are engaged in language, right. in the field of language, how rich that is is what um, is more fundamental than SES across the no, Absolutely. No, absolutely. And see, there are a lot of studies done. I mean, again, this is in some sense common sense. There's a black conservative at Hoover, Tom Sowell. He has a PhD here from the University of Chicago. He has very strong political views. I don't want to get into those views, but he makes a very useful observation. He looks at the progress of immigrant groups. A great test case. You know, all the Vietnamese Chinese who came over after the Vietnam War. Dirt poor. They were American collaborators. They had to give up all their assets. They were lucky to get out of uh, Vietnam or else they'd have been re-educated for a few years or maybe killed. They came with nothing, but they did have a huge desire to teach their children language and skills and to make their children learn. Well, now we need barriers at Berkeley to keep these kids from taking over all of Berkeley. If, you were, if Berkeley were completely... Uh, blind in its admissions policy, we'd probably have a 100% Asian Berkeley. And a lot of those kids, not all of them, would be from those very poor families who cared. I mean, the stories of the Jews in an earlier generation, a whole group of immigrant groups, immigrants, you know, the Jamaicans who came, you know, Colin Powell, I mean, people like this. Immigrants generally mean well for their kids. They came because they wanted to succeed, and they typically are more caring about their kids. Uh, and we know that other groups have been less careful about these kids. There's something about the drive to be successful. To well, inspire. part of yeah, to be successful, and there's a pride that most people take in seeing their children succeed. Because inevitably they say, well, you know, I'm partly responsible for this. Even if the kid <laughs> would never admit it in 100 years. And it's probably true. So you don't want the, you don't want the kid to admit it. That's not the point. But I think in the end there's a sense you want to make a world a little better place. And... Uh, I think that kids' uh, investments are huge in this regard, and I think that parents leave that legacy, and it's not money. It's not money. It's not just ca And we know it's not money, too, because we gave lots of money to disadvantaged families in the 60s and 70s in welfare projects. We raised. You know, many people are still beating the drum of saying, we know how to cure poverty, just give cash transfers. But the cash transfers didn't change the family structure, didn't change the reading patterns to the kids, didn't do anything along those lines, and it tended to perpetuate maybe even make worse the intergenerational linkage. Uh, so yes, read it. So it seems that, that learning, language, literacy are the lever 
and the family is the fulcrum in terms of shifting the inequality. The family is, is essential, not only through its genetic uh, endowments, but through its ability to affect the way those genes are expressed and to create the environmental structure that, that, that builds people. I mean, the, you know, the idea that we're fully bloomed, uh, fully born, sorry, sprout out from some genetic uh, idea, that's an old idea. I mean, that was what Herrnstein and Murray were trading on. It was obsolete science when they did it. They had no evidence for it. It, it, feel, it feeds into a viewpoint that, say, blacks are inferior and all these problems have to be viewed. I mean, don't forget, social Darwinism it wasn't original to uh, Herrnstein and Murray. I mean, the Mexican Republic was built on that idea, and many countries have been built on that idea in the 19th century, that some people were just born inferior, born poor, and so forth. I think what we've learned is that that's a very obsolete idea, that some, the idea that certain races and classes are inevitable is only a result of our not really understanding how rich uh, and, uh, and manipulable, really, and, and alterable, I should say, the uh, genes... Uh, uh, any, the genetic expressions are, and the interactions are between genes and environment. It, it, just in respect, I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you, and I'm really enjoying this. There's a couple of quotes that, from your paper that I thought were particularly powerful. One having to do with skill begets skill, learning begets learning, early advantage uh, accumulates, early disadvantage accumulates. That just pithy statement. Could, do you remember that part? Oh, very much so. I'm you working on a paper this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Uh, very, I, mean, I have a paper coming out, and it's called the Interpreting the Evidence on Life Cycle Skill Formation, a paper down with Flavio Cunha, Dmitry Masteroff, and Lance Lochner. It's coming out in the Handbook of the Economics of Education this year or early next year, edited by Welch and, uh, and uh, uh, Hanischek, actually, and, uh, and Welch. But uh, the idea really is, as we know from these studies we were talking about earlier, that the dynamics of skill formation are extremely uh, well studied, and they that 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 a skills and abilities acquired at one stage in the life cycle, one age, say, are inputs into the next stage. So economists like to think about production technology. Here we know that if we give people more cognitive and non-cognitive skills, it makes it easier to learn at the next stage. Hence the reading stuff we were talking about earlier, and it also tends to create uh, attitudes and abilities that make it easier to learn. So one thing we know is that. If you look, for example, at a topic that every politician who runs for office talks about, which is the high cost of college tuition, college very high, college going may be too low, people say. What we need to do is cut subsidy, increase tuition, subsidies, reduce the cost of college. Everywhere you go around the world, in at least the Western world, you see this. Well, what do we know? We know that once we condition on ability in these studies about who goes to college and who doesn't, family income plays no role. None. In fact, we find that minorities are more likely to go to college, everything else the same, than the majority group members, once we condition on ability. The whole deficit is starting with ability. It's, it's ability. Now, these ability gaps are opening up at a very early age. And if anything, they increase. But, but that's the notion of skill begets skill. Skill begets skill. Abilities beget abilities. They're multiple in nature. Cognitive abilities affect non-cognitive. Like you were saying, if you fail at certain tasks, that can lead to certain senses of expectations about yourself as being a failure. Turn it around, though. That non-cognitive, you know, negative initial perceptions where your kid is thought to be inferior, an idiot, a member of a lower class, and so forth and so on, the kid may not adventure out there. If the kid actually feels that he's threatened in the world, uh, then that child may not try to uh, try to seek the very aspect of social encounter which leads to learning. So there's this huge structure of encouragement and skill, which which we do understand, which we do understand, and which underlies all serious policy towards the economics of uh, human skill formation. So the skill begets skill is a simple motto. I, I coined it about eight or nine years ago. People have picked up on a lot. I see. Uh, but I think it's very important because there really is the dynamics to this process. Or we invest, that skills propagate, and that skills are multiple in nature. It's not like just, just IQ. You see, it's not just reading. It's the whole uh, a panoply, the whole array of skills out there, cognitive and non-cognitive, that interact to produce something that is the human being. So the structure uh, really is that it's skills beget skills, I would say. I would use the plural. 
And then I would say the difference between skills and abilities has obliterated. You know, it's no longer true when we think about genes as they're being invariant. Many people think of the gene, but that's crazy. You look at any of the modern studies, and I was just at Johns Hopkins last week talking to some epidemiologists. Who are, what are they doing? They're doing experiments on human beings where there are these viruses injected into the cells at particular locations which modify the genes at those locations. And so you can do this over the whole human body. We do know we can modify genes. Genes are not invariant, and they're totally dependent. So you look at the serotonin flow of the mother. You look at the development of these glucocorticoids, and you look at various kinds of, of neural expressions. What you're finding is stimulus of the mother, the stressors that lead, give rise to these uh, to things like the glucocorticoids and the, and the you know, thing, cortisol and various names, affect the development process, can retard or promote the development process and affect brain formation. This happens even in the uterus, but certainly happens in the early years after the child is born. So that if you go from the time where you are looking at the very first stages of life, uh, these things that are so-called genetic turn out to be very experientially determined. You know, maternal smoking, 20% of all women now, pregnant women are still smoking. What do we know? We know that there's a typical IQ deficit that comes from smoking. We know that the, that the kids of mothers who smoke are more likely to smoke. We also know that uh, a maternal drinking, the fetal alcohol syndrome, very serious for the consequence of these. So these, these are, quote, genetic factors that are determined Study. by uh, Tremblay. You find very interesting results. The interesting results are that family, you know, there's a certain predisposition to violence, more common among boys and girls. There's certain now genes that have been isolated. Now you ask, well, what happens, though, if you find yourself, you have a child who has this kind of manifestation, some genetic predisposition, say? Well, the environmental interaction is huge. So if the parents react to it negatively, you grow up in a harsh environment, you can reinforce it and make the child more aggressive. The alternative is the upper middle class family, spanking the kid, taking careful, great care of the kid. Maybe the kid won't grow up to be a saint, but the kid will grow up to be far more orderly, far more assimilated to the rest of society. So there is a very strong evidence. This is where the identical twin uh, studies get thrown out, right? <laughs> well, the identical kind of twin studies are not. I mean, look, Turkheimer, who was one of the behavioral geneticists, uh, wrote this paper two years ago, very interesting paper, pointing out the structure of uh, uh, that these heritability calculations were completely dependent on socioeconomic status. So that you can find that the expressions of the negative traits were completely, well, not completely, but were much less likely to be found if, if from families at higher socioeconomic status. So we know that environments can affect things. Look, the IQ of the human race is going up by one standard deviation every generation. That suggests strong behavioral components. It's not just some gene that you grew up with in Africa or Europe and stayed with you for time immemorial. These things are very strong. Yeah, it suggests that the entire milieu that we're living in is exercising uh, uh, our differentiation in a way that's bootstrapping our intelligence. Well, it does, among other things, yeah. But we also know directly we can affect not only genes, but genetic expressions. We can actually now, by intervening, we can trigger certain behaviors. It's not all the evidence isn't in, but a lot of evidence is in that suggests very strongly that there are these uh, behavioral components to gene expression. So the idea that there's a love gene or a hate gene or, I mean, a lot of this is just pop science. So you, you see a lot of people, you know, uh, amazing number of people who, who should be a little more careful, uh, you know, build on these ideas. But the fact is that we see a huge amount of uh, gene uh, environment interaction. Yeah, my sense is uh, there's a number of geneticists who've said, look, you know, to whatever extent the genes are regulating things um, in a in a uh, uh, determining way, that's really outside of our scope anyway. I mean, the question is 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 how what can we do? What can we do that right. no, that, that's, that's, that's the lifting the lives of people into a greater opportunity to be part of a collective that's living with right? No, I don't think we've exhausted all. I mean, it's not like we have a for, formula now that we can apply. It's an area that needs constant study, and it needs to be rejuvenated. But on the other hand, we do have a lot of information that's suggestive that we can change a lot of what we used to think of as socially 
or bi biologically predetermined uh, predispositions. I mean, look, 50 years ago, people in Chicago uh, were saying that you couldn't hire black secretaries. Blacks were still inferior. And it was probably true at the time that there were many less educated blacks compared to educated whites. Uh, many of the blacks were from the rural South where education had been denied black. We don't say that anymore. There are a lot of tremendously successful. And, and of course, the idea that this was genetic, somehow the blacks were inferior genetically. Well, they weren't genetically inferior. That's a, a very obsolete perspective. I mean, there's certainly many disadvantaged minority groups still, but I don't think that many people will now see this as a genetic predisposition. Clearly. So the question becomes, what is it that's propagating, that's transmitting, that's causing the... Culture, family. Okay, yeah. fa culture. Culture as the right. environment that family's operating in. Exactly. And family at the intimate level. And then what's the, what's the pipeline of that transmission? And that's where it seems that neuroscience, um, the study of infant development and infant behavior in the early stages, and then uh, kind of macro social studies like uh, Farkas has done, um, keep coming back to... Auditory processing, language. At the core, we are more than anything else. We are users of language. Language is the medium of our learning. Well, that's supposedly the great miracle that occurred somewhere between 70,000 and, what, 500,000 years ago, a lot of debate. Depending on which anthropologist. <laughs> right. But, I mean, it's certainly true that language makes us pretty distinctive. And acquisition of language is far from secure. And uh, it's not a, it, it certainly seems to have strong social basis, the acquisition of language, and disadvantaged people, the mark of disadvantage. Don't forget the old days when it used to be that anybody with a southern accent was considered an idiot. Well, I think the reason for that, the, the, the sort of racial or the linguistic profiling uh, basis for that, was the fact that a lot of ed southerners at that time weren't so well educated. There was a big gap between the south and the north. Still a little gap, but it's, it's not American, much. American My Fair Lady. Yes. No, an idea, exactly. The idea was that language really did connote what you understood, who you were, how, what you thought of yourself. Now, there's some snobbery involved in that. But, and I don't think, you know, a Southern accent is any mark of any, any intelligence one way or the other. But I think that the issue is probably that at one time it was a pretty good predictor of a level of education that people had, which means that those individuals probably had a little less factual knowledge and maybe were a little less able to compete in certain skills. Uh, but my point is, is that the idea that this is somehow a predisposition, that there are these types, that there are these invariant characteristics, that's nuts. I don't think anybody views that as being important anymore. And I think everything we learn from neuroscience says that we can alter these expressions, provided we get in there early enough. Which comes back to, again, what we're talking about is the, the emotional affective field and the language field that children are developing. in. Right. That's important. I agree. I agree. The language is very important because it's the it's the vehicle. I mean, you really if you don't have language, it's going to be hard to even learn mathematics. Really, I mean, you I mean you may you've got to be able to at least know what the numbers are and be able to communicate verbally. Meta reflection, the buffer space in in mental memory, and your ability to go abstract or be meta to what it is you're thinking about is built in language. It's in language, although I'm not sure ideas are all language. I mean, some abstractions are probably more than just idea than just words. I mean, you don't literally have to think everything out uh, verbally to achieve. A no, kind but, of abstraction. but until such time as we would have dialogues with people that were nonverbal and that we could understand what they were doing, we wouldn't know anything about. No, but I'm just thinking in terms of our own thought processes. They're not all verbal. You start making connections. And you can start thinking about very abstract images that are no longer verbal, mathematical. For sure, but, but could we have gotten to the stage where we have that kind of reflection <laughs> without the language, even though it may not well, be... So, so, ask and answer, Paul. I don't know the yeah, exactly. Okay. I, I really don't know. My, I, mean, my, I a linguist. What, what's, what seems clear is, is that the, um, from a point of view of observing the children, um, how well they are able to engage in language seems to be the central predictor. Oh, absolutely. No, that's, I've read enough studies. I haven't worked in that area. I don't want to hold myself as an authority in that area, but I've read enough studies to strongly suggest, uh, to concur with that opinion. I mean, no question. Um, I want to circle back to this. Skill begets skill, learning begets learning. Early advantage, if left untouched, leads to academic and social difficulties in later years. And use of this so well. Advantages accumulate, so do disadvantages. Yes. Just that short, kind of pithy run of those couple of sentences. Could you do that once for the camera? What do you mean? Just 
Um, just say these things? <laughs> just say these things, or however you want to now that feels Well, no, I think we know. But boom. No, uh, w the, the, I call this the technology of human skill formation. And it is that skill begets skill, that knowledge begets knowledge, and that we have a dynamic process. It's a growth trajectory. You can start off early and accelerate. You can start off early and just go off the rails. And so it's the dynamic process. Human beings are not fixed creatures. They can change. They do change. They develop. If somebody gets far off the developmental process, they're going to be at a major disadvantage, may never be able to catch up. It'll be very costly to get them to catch up. And it's costly the later you go in trying to remediate the disadvantage. On the other hand, you start with a guy, a girl, whoever, uh, who gets a very good advantage. And this feeds back a sense of self-confidence, a sense of command, control, and adventure. So you go out and you learn more. And you get what economists call increasing returns. You just, you know, the more input, the more output, but not just one for one, but maybe one for two. So there really are dynamic features to these models where you actually inputs, more inputs, create even more, uh, greater outputs. Excellent. Okay. Okay. I think we're done. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. so, Very thank good. You oh, so it's much. almost four. Yeah. Well, longer than agreed. Well, that's all right. Yeah, that's good. I, I really want to get.